Tom Cruise has always seemed to be more of a personality than a person. He's flip-flopped between seeming like a genuine human being. I mean, I really, I live a very normal life. To, uh... There's nothing part of the way for me. <laughs> it's just... Whatever this is. He is the American movie star. The inspiration for Patrick Bateman and the last ambassador for practical action set pieces. What distinguishes Tom Cruise, especially in recent decades, is doing it for real. He is committed to filling his movies with in-camera spectacle. From the stunts to the vehicles to the sweat on his face, what they shot on the day is what you see on the screen no tricks. He's worked with just about every big league director, from Scorsese to Spielberg to Kubrick to Zwick to McCory to Kaczynski to De Palma to Coppola to Scott to Scott to PTA to JJ to Crow to Bird to Man and more. The list is long. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 is his 43rd movie. The list is also distinguished. Most A-list actors are lucky to have 5 good movies. Tom Cruise has about 20. He has evolved from the sex symbol of the 80s to the art house character actor of the 90s to the daredevil action man of the 2000s. Is he an insane maniac who's come to indoctrinate us all in the cult of Scientology? Is he just a hardworking man who loves movies here to humbly entertain us? The only way to find out who the real Tom Cruise is, who this character he plays is, is watching every character he has ever played. This is every Tom Cruise movie in chronological order, from 1981 all the way to 2023. I'll be picking them out and ranking them from worst to best. So jump on your couch and enjoy getting mad at the screen and hopefully learning a little something about the biggest someone. In the middle of the 2010s, every movie studio was trying to reproduce the success of the MCU. By far the funniest failed attempt is Universal Studios' Dark Universe. With plans for a selection of monster movies, starting off with The Mummy, to Frankenstein, to Wolfman, to Dracula, that culminate in the musical crossover event, Monster Mash. I'm not joking, it would have been glorious. I want to see a monster movie now. After the critical failure of The Mummy, all monster-themed crossover events were abandoned. Universal is still making monster movies, such as The Invisible Man and Renfield, they're just not all part of the same universe. The Invisible Man made 10 times its budget, but Renfield just flopped. So who knows what the future of monster movies look like. Unfortunately, despite being the worst movie ever, The Mummy did not flop. Never underestimate the power of the global box office to eat up crap. Can't wait for... We're gonna do... Mummy too. You know that's happening. Doing an autopsy on the mummy is easy. It is an unfathomably stupid movie. It takes away all the joy of adventure movies by not asking any intriguing questions and instead making boring observations. It's Egyptian. It's a canal system. The hieroglyphs are definitely New Kingdom. It is definitely a tomb. Really, that's what we've been doing. We've been really pushing the edges of storytelling. Tom Cruise spends most of the movie posing for the trailers by staring at things dumbfounded. The only good part of this movie is this zero-g sequence, which I wish was in a much better movie. Before Rock of Ages, I was naive. I believe that when it came to movies, there were no bad ideas, just bad execution. If it's possible to make a good movie about Facebook or Lego, then you can make a good movie about anything. 
but now I don't know what to believe, because a musical with rock songs is one of the stupidest ideas I've ever heard. But Rock of Ages isn't just a stupid idea, it hits us with a double hit combo. The ideas and execution stoop to the same level. Now, regardless if you like these songs or not, we've heard them too much. Classic rock has become a corporate, people-pleasing soundtrack. It's in movie trailers, the mall, and laundry detergent ads, but where is it missing? Musicals. If there is a way to make this idea work, Rock of Ages doesn't know how. The movie strips down each song to their most basic interpretation. Fuckboy McGee character is lost, so he sings Here I Go Again. I don't know where I'm going. The only place this movie is going is the clearance bin at Walmart. Rock of Ages tells the story of a small town girl with big dreams. Within the opening minutes, she pulls out a photo of herself and her grandma and smiles at it. Just like that, it's clear that she is not a character, she is a puppet. For the next two hours, along with a cast of celebrities, she does and says exactly what you expect her to. I am so happy. I am so happy. I am human. I feel emotion. It's an exhausting movie where nothing exciting or unexpected happens except for one thing, the songs. Because the scariest part of this movie is the moment when they start singing. Yes, and what a lovely morning. Usually in a musical, there's a build up to the song. The melody starts trickling in, the characters are tapping their feet, and we're up in the sky and everybody's singing. But in Rock of Ages, it's always a sneak attack. In the midst of a conversation scene, from one line to the next, they're singing. And when you're up there, you can have it. Anywhere you want. Or they only give you one line of dialogue to prepare. We built this city on rock and roll! Yes, yeah, we did! We built this city! There's a scene that takes place at the Hollywood sign. It's like a giant velvet blanket covered in diamonds. Yeah. Beautiful, isn't it? That was shot at a dumpster landfill in Florida. I can't believe Tom Cruise is in this movie. I can only imagine he was contractually obligated to do it because it sticks out in the midst of his intentional career. He plays a rock star who is drowning in sex and drugs until he finds meaning in life by finding his true love, who he forms a deep emotional connection with by having sex again. Jack Reacher Never Go Back has the most beautifully ironic title ever. Yeah, never going back to Jack Reacher is a great idea. And really, it's never go back. You know, he should not have gone back. This movie has nothing to offer. It is the driest action mystery I've ever seen. There's a scene where the characters are cornered, head to head with the main bad honcho. A kitchen provides a thousand different possibilities for a creative fight scene. Smack the opponent with a plate, squirt some mayonnaise in his eyes, I don't know, use a knife? So how do they make creative use of this environment? She has a meat hammer and he pushes is a cart into the bad guy, and then they punch, kick, and throw each other into things until the fight is over. The environment does not matter, this movie does not matter. Tom Cruise is completely miscast. Seeing him as the quiet, stoic super soldier is not why we go to see Tom Cruise at the movies. We want a charming maniac, not an expressionless face who says dumb action man lines. I'm gonna break your arms. I'm gonna break your legs. I'm gonna break your neck. And Reacher is a very, he's a badass, tough character who is going to confront something right straight on and go right at it and that's the force of that character is is uh it's it's really interesting very dynamic to play the only face more neutral than tom cruise's was mine watching this movie Lions for Lambs is a hard movie to review because it is not really a movie. It is an assortment of American political arguments told by characters who exist only to be mouthpieces for debate. Every character is a stand-in for a demographic or occupation and isn't given much characterization beyond that, making it impossible to empathize with them. The movie is directed by Robert Redford, which explains why so many high-profile actors including Tom are in it. Tom Cruise plays a senator and makes a hell of a case for Tom Cruise being a politician if it weren't for the whole, you know.
There's a really interesting time in the careers of most big actors, before their big break film when they don't have the luxury of choice because they're not the most famous person in the world yet. The fact that they have to take whatever job they can get leaves us with some of their most interesting movies. Hey! Are you messing around with that? Hey, I'm not messing around with that. For Arnold, it was the underappreciated gem that is Hercules in New York. I don't know. I could not lift it. My strength. It seemed to work on. For Tom Cruise, it's losing it. A low-budget, low-quality, high-school hangout comedy where Tom Cruise tries to lose it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> He tries to get laid for the first time, but not for the last, as this starts a series of movies throughout Tom Cruise's career where his character's goal is to get his Tom cruised. When I say a series of movies, I mean about half of all his movies. If the trope for Arnold is saving children, the trope for Tom is chasing women. Tom Cruise always wants to get laid, and if he's not chasing it, He's teaching it. Maybe he runs so much because her parents aren't home. <laughs> I'll stop with the sex jokes. Losing it sucks. The movie follows Cruz and his buddies on their quest to wet their willies. They get into some pretty wacky adventures. Tom cucks some guy, one of his friends ends up in prison, and the other is suspended from a crane with the threat of castration because he tried to drug a girl. You know, wacky high school adventures. Tom Cruise hasn't emerged into his Tom Cruise persona. He plays a shy kid who gives into peer pressure from his asshole friends. In real life, the only reason Tom Cruise did this movie was because his agent pressured him to. He later said in an interview that he regretted doing the movie. From here on out, he'd go on to make much more intentional choices in his career, only working with the highest profile directors. Night and Day is Tom Cruise's closest thing to a D-tier Marvel movie. It reaches the same heights of comedic genius. And we're gonna run to those shells over there. Okay. Okay? okay. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. One. <gasps> Sorry. Tom Cruise plays a super spy who navigates each action scene in creative mode. Bullets are just background noise, and Newton's laws have been rewritten by Wile E. Coyote. It's also a rare case when Tom isn't the lead. Instead, we follow Cameron Diaz as, um, as, a June Havens, a working girl who is definitely a real person. She's got flaws and is relatable. She has a uh, character traits, uh, like she likes cars, and she has a sister, and. Yeah, that's enough. This movie is Tom Cruise doing an action scene where Cameron Diaz is freaking out. Repeat, 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 and they fall in love. Aww. Even as I was watching the movie, it felt more like a pre-show movie theater trailer for a movie that I was never going to watch than an actual movie. It has no purpose outside of being another action-adventure romantic comedy. As I rented this movie on Apple, I saw an ad for a new movie with the exact same premise. The most exciting part of the movie is its beginning before it becomes clear that the next two hours will be spent within the confines of recycled formula. When Tom Cruise eats ice cream, that's the highlight. Michael Chapman is the cinematographer behind timeless classics such as Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, and Kindergarten Cop. The list of movies that he's involved in the cinematography of reads like a best of list of the 70s and 80s. His list of directing credits is much shorter and much less distinguished, the best known being all the right moves. Everybody should direct at least once, if only to get it out of their system, if they possibly can. Because most, particularly cameramen, go around for years saying, my God, I could have done better than that. Look at that idiot. What, what are, you know? And then most of the time we are dreadfully wrong and we couldn't have done better. I, I proved that. Released two months after Risky Business made Tom Cruise a global superstar is a kind of charming yet very dull drama where Tom Cruise plays football. Considering the stakes of his later work is his life, both in the movie and while making the movie, if nothing else it's endearing to see a movie where the dramatic dilemma is whether or not he gets into college. Tom's character gets into a misunderstanding with his football coach, played by Mr. Incredible, who's preventing him to get the scholarship that would be his ticket out of his deadbeat town. It is exactly as boring as that sounds. Have you 
heard from any recruiters yet? Steph, who's kidding who? You know the only reason why I'm playing since Plazowitz is hurt. Mission Impossible 2 is a miracle of stupidity. It's a sequel that confidently misunderstands everything that made the first movie compelling. The Palma's sharp direction, heart-stopping set pieces, the unraveling of a mystery, Ethan Hunt being smart. These are all thrown out the window in favor of corny macho schlock. Director John Woo's brand of action doesn't work for the Mission Impossible franchise. His Hong Kong action films from The Killer to Hard Boiled are classics of action cinema. In those movies, he pioneered a style of action called Gun Fu, which is exactly what it sounds like. The thing is, Ethan Hunt is not John Wick. He goes from not firing a gun at all in the first movie, Zero body count. to this. The action in it is completely mind-blowing. They turned Ethan Hunt into a completely different character. He becomes a horny, moody, naughty boy. There's a car chase between the two romantic leads where they give each other quirky smiles while risking the lives of the unsuspecting drivers on that road. Ethan Hunt risks his life and those of the people around him not because the lives of millions are at stake, but because he's horny. In the other Mission Impossible movies, Ethan Hunt rarely wants to do his death-defying stunts. Part of the humor and tension of these situations lies in the fact that they are the only way to complete the mission. I'm telling you, we can get to it from outside. We? I'm, I'm on the computer. Uh, I'm just uh, a helper. Okay. What floor is he on? What he's doing is crazy, but it's selfless, so we care. In Mission Impossible 2, Ethan Hunt free climbs a cliff for fun. As a kid, anytime I get to the edge, I want to jump off. I don't know what it is. It's subconscious. I don't want to kill myself. I want to fly. The movie is grounded in a cartoon reality where the laws of physics take a backseat to the laws of Ethan Hunt being a cool guy. It is full of bold, stylized moments that do nothing for the story. There's a bit where the villain catches a scarf and the movie treats that moment like the soul of the universe depended on that scarf. Or put up with cheeky bastards who set me up on their territory so they can poach on mine. She doesn't do laundry? Damn, she must be stinky. The writing in this movie is so good. It's rich. And it's it's just what what you know what I want when I when I go to a movie like this. That I appreciate when I see good writing in, in movies like this. You mean it'll be difficult? Very. Well, this is not mission difficult, Mr. Hunt. It's mission impossible. Difficult to be a walk in the park for you. The writing in this movie is so good. Days of Thunder is not Top Gun but with cars. Okay? Top Gun is military propaganda, and Days of Thunder does not promote racing. It promotes Budweiser, Tide, Heinz, Pepsi, Purolator, and Mellow Yellow, but not NASCAR. Okay, yeah, it does promote NASCAR. The movie is partly funded by them and is shot on their racetrack, but that's where the Top Gun similarities end. Oh, yeah, okay. Except for the intro, and Tom Cruise rides a motorcycle, ending is pretty much the same and there's a blonde love interest and it's the same director okay yeah it is top gun but with cars my top gun hot take is that the most boring parts of top gun are when they're flying jets i think tony scott's biggest strength as a director is the way he directs character interactions not action choreography so it's a shame that 80 percent of this movie is racing engine noises and motion blur the ethical dilemma is, racing is dangerous, but it sure is cool. <sighs> it's, it's pretty dangerous, but damn is it cool. They don't even attempt to flesh out the characters because then less of the movie would be about racing. So almost every character only exists within the context of racing. This is my job. 
That's all I know. You can tell they focused all of their resources on shooting the coolest racing scenes possible. They rigged up a car with cameras to film the race cars at 120 miles per hour. They shoved cameras inside the race cars. They placed 28 cameras along a two and a half mile racetrack to capture as many angles as possible. Any permutation of cameras placed in race cars or racetracks, they did it. But really, the biggest genius of this movie is whoever thought of the characters' names. Cole Trickle, Rowdy Burns, Russ Wheeler, Jimmy Engine. Okay, I made that last one up. Tom Cruise and Michael Rooker's dick measuring contests are always fun. Uh, there's a scene where Robert Duvall sensually rubs a car while flirting with it. Hans Zimmer's score is a funky bop, one of the most memorable of Tom Cruise's filmography. Look it up, it's fucking awesome. Days of Thunder was made with an insane time constraints. Tony Scott would storyboard the shots on the morning that they'd be filmed. Tom Cruise didn't have enough time to learn his lines, so he put flashcards of his dialogue on the windshield while he drove which worked great until he crashed. The shooting lasted three months longer than anticipated and the release date was pushed back half a month because they couldn't edit it in time. It also went $30 million over budget. It's a miracle that they made a halfway coherent movie. From Days of Thunder to Tropic Thunder, we have got more thunder, but no lightning. Wait, I got a better idea. Instead of a hundred million, how about I send you a hobo's dick cheese? Tropic Thunder is a comedy that thinks that being outrageous and crass is the same as being funny. Tom Cruise disappears into the role of Les Grossman, the movie producer who has fat hands and loves to dance. He's got about 10 minutes of screen time and is thankfully paired with Bill Hader, who's usually the best part of any early 2000s comedy he's in. <laughs> Tom Cruise was 19 when he played a supporting role in Taps. It's technically his second feature film, but his first real role. His first movie is a little romantic drama called Endless Love, where he made his feature film debut running into the shot and then fondly reminiscing about that one time he burned a house down. Some woman did that to me, I'd burn her damn house down. Hey, I tried that. Did I ever tell you guys? Eight years old and I was into RC. You're full of it. No, I'm serious. I lit a whole pile of newspapers. You ever try to light a whole pile of wet newspapers? He then leaves the movie never to be seen again. Taps also stars younger versions of Sean Penn, Gustavo Fring, and Timothy Hutton. It's one of those old movies where each scene is as emotionally compelling as Apple's terms and conditions. Every second is a battle, as you struggle to keep your eyes locked at the screen without checking the timeline again for the fifth time. It somewhat makes up for its graveyard pace with some explosive performances, especially from these two kids and Tom himself, who plays an obedient student turned homicidal maniac. It's beautiful, man! Which Tom Cruise always does an exceptional job playing. Valkyrie is a Mission Impossible movie pretending to be a historical biopic. The mission? To kill Hitler. Tom Cruise plays Lieutenant Stauffenberg, a German officer who plotted to assassinate Hitler, making a very close attempt on his life. Valkyrie's historical accuracy is painstaking. Its plot rarely deviates from the real events it's based on. It features authentic World War II planes and is mostly shot in the actual locations where the events took place. The problem isn't the authentic Nazi costumes, it's the people wearing them. Valkyrie's downfall is trying to be an authentic World War II drama while also being a $90 million Hollywood movie starring Tom Cruise. A movie with so much money behind it is boxed into certain creative decisions in the pursuit of being commercially successful, such as casting well-known actors and having them speak English. It is impossible to be lost in a World War II biographical drama when it is so clearly Bill Nye talking to Tom Cruise. Nothing breaks the immersion like seeing Hitler speak English to his fellow Nazis. Let this man stand as an example to all of you. He is the idea of German officer. It doesn't help that none of the characters are portrayed like real people with idiosyncrasies and flaws and are instead turned into generic good guys and bad guys. There were other sides to my uh, to my granddad. 
there's little time to show them, although there is a scene where the children where, you know, they're trying to hint at that. We are supposed to root for Stauffenberg only because we know Hitler is evil and because he has a family, but he doesn't have any characterization beyond that. That being said, it does succeed at building some tension despite us already knowing how things turn out. The best part of Valkyrie is it's the first collab between Tom Cruise and Christopher McQuarrie, who have now worked together on eight films, soon to be nine. read the book since grade 7 in English class, but the film adaptation is outstandingly mediocre. If the book is anything like the movie, I understand why it's in my school's English curriculum. It makes for easy essay material. Its message could not be more obvious if it slapped you in the face. Did you know that uh, class differences equals depth? You don't need a watch mojo video to figure this one out. The Outsiders hits all the book adaptation cliches, stilted dialogue, silhouette sunset shots, painful narration, the protagonist wants to be a writer. The weirdest part being, this is directed by the guy behind the most critically acclaimed book adaptation ever. The drama feels engineered. Instead of arising organically from the character's choices, it's often driven by fabricated plot points. At one point, the characters stumble upon a burning building that just happen to have kids in it that need to be saved. What's going on? Wonder how that started. Again and again, the film blindly adheres to the book at the expense of having a nuanced and believable story. Now, I will say good things. It is beautifully shot, there's a Stevie Wonder song in the opening credits, and they got every 70s and 80s teenage heartthrob in the same movie. Karate Kid, Breakfast Club, Dirty Dancer, Dylan, Low, everyone! Their group dynamic is fun too. I haven't mentioned Tom Cruise yet, maybe because he's barely in this movie. He's a side character's side character. He eats chocolate cake, arm wrestles, and does his first stunt. <laughs> Three years after Blade Runner, became the greatest movie to bomb at the box office, director Ridley Scott's atmospheric worlds of miniatures and sound made the transition from sci-fi to fantasy. Legend is as vague and general as its title. It's a medieval fantasy tangled up in all the genre's tropes. Tom Cruise plays Jack, a forest boy. He doesn't say or do much other than crouch and stare intensely, like Peter Pan on ecstasy. He also doesn't wear any pants. The dialogue is the worst case scenario crossover between Dr. Seuss and Shakespeare. Maybe innocent, maybe sweet, ain't half as nice as rotting meat. If the dialogue was muted, legend would be higher on this list because everything is covered with glitter and everything is practical. There's so much beauty in the craftsmanship of this movie, from the prosthetic makeup to the lighting to the handmade sets. Credit is due to special makeup effects creator Rob Botton, whose resume also includes The Thing, Total Recall, and Robocop. His standout creation in Legend is Satan, who looks like handsome Squidward. Legend ended up being a disaster in almost every sense. One of the sets burned down mid-production, it flopped at the box office, making only 15 million of its 20 million dollar budget, and similarly to Blade Runner, the movie's been hacked up and reassembled in four different cuts. Some are 60 minutes shorter, have entirely different soundtracks, or include an opening crawl. Unlike Blade Runner, none of the movie's problems can be saved in post. It's an incredible sounding and looking hodgepodge of fantasy tropes and nonsensical rhymes. Vanilla Sky is a remake of the Spanish thriller Open Your Eyes. I remember in elementary school whenever I had to write a short story I never knew how to finish it so I'd always end it with and then he woke up and it was all a dream. Open Your Eyes is a really tensely plotted movie where that ending actually works. Vanilla Sky's ending is on par with my fourth grade literature. Vanilla Sky copies almost every story beat from Open Your Eyes. It is insane because it is exactly the same movie, beat for beat, but told in a completely different way. It takes you down exactly the same narrative twists and turns. Then it differs in every other way. Dialogue, music, casting, production design, everything. It makes for an excellent case study of how important it is to get all of those right. Open your eyes. Abre los ojos. Abre. 
and open your eyes the protagonist slowly comes to realize that his perception of reality is off. In the end we realize that he has died and is dreaming a hundred years in the future. He decides to accept his mortality and end the dream. It is an insightful film about the nature of dreams, the inevitability of death, and how our appearance affects our relationship with ourselves and others. The story is told in a very grounded way, without crazy stylistic flourishes unless they help tell the story. Vanilla Sky is full of stylistic flourishes and added themes that do not mesh with the story. Within the exact same story beat says open your eyes, Vanilla Sky inserts a theme about how pop culture affects our perception of reality by filling the frame with celebrity cameos, French New Wave movie posters, and Radiohead songs. It tries to be more, and ends up being bloated and meaningless because of that. None of the subtext is clear and the ending is over explained. But everything is explained and it, it should be, uh, when it's a puzzle, a wonderful puzzle never meant to confuse you. Too many answers are spoon-fed to us, leaving no room for speculation or critical thinking. He will run. <laughs> he will run. And he ran for hours. Yeah. Far and Away is about as authentically Irish as a box of Lucky Charms. The characters say things like, That's a long-legged piece of strawberry tart. I'm Joseph Donnelly, of the family Donnelly, that you pushed off our land. It is a period piece crossed with an 80s comedy, where the funniest part is when it tries to be a period piece. It is about an Irish peasant and aristocrat, played by Cruz and Kidman, who do outstanding performances as Hollywood actors pretending to be Irish immigrants. I especially love Tom Cruise's accent because there are multiple times when it takes a break and he is full-on American Tom Cruise. There's my boy, looking fit and dandy. How are you, Scrapper? Never better, Mike. <laughs> then who the hell are you, lass, coming into my club? She's... I'm... my sister. This is a scene with a close-up of Tom Cruise's butt crack. grew up with John Wayne with whole movie cinema image, the toy guns, the Madame Mattel submachine guns that we got every Christmas. The whole generation was prepped and hyped and, and conditioned by our culture, which is so violent and which is so, uh, which so romanticizes war. We were ready to go. We were ready to fight. Uh, we thought that uh, the war was going to be like the John Wayne movies, but it wasn't. It was different. And when we came home and tried to tell the American public about the reality of the Vietnam War, that it wasn't a war. To, uh, to help people, but it was a crime against humanity and against the Vietnamese people. And they didn't listen to us. They threw us in jail. They called me a traitor. They spit in my face. Remember Lions for Lambs? Born on the 4th of July is a better version of that. Instead of following two political mouthpieces in a room blabbering at each other, we follow a character making decisions and then living with the consequences. The calamity of the Vietnam War is felt because we follow someone who is destroyed by it. Don't you know what it means to me to be a Marine dad? Ever since I was a kid, I've wanted this. I wanted to serve my country, and I want to go. I want to go to Vietnam, and I'll die there if I have to. A boy believes in a myth, and a man loses everything because of that. This is one of Tom Cruise's best performances, one of the few times where you will forget that you are watching Tom Cruise. He's been invaluable to me. I mean, I, he's been very uh, generous. You know, I mean, it's about his life, and I want to portray him accurately. Where this movie falls short is when it's being a predictable Hollywood war movie. When the kids are playing war while sad patriotic music plays, the entire movie has already been spelled out. Risky Business is like a stale chocolate chip cookie. A lot of the movie is a textbook raunchy high school comedy. And then crunch. We've got a bit of chocolate. And then we're back in the blando. And then what's this? Chocolate. 
The most interesting part of Risky Business is how it turned the actor who played the crazy guy in Taps into Tom Cruise, leading man. The movie crushed the box office, making the combined gross of its previous two films. Are you ready for uh, kind of what could be instant fame for you? Yeah, three year instant fame. <laughs> um, it's just allowing me more freedom in the scripts stuff so I guess it would be pretty nice. I suspect Risky Business was so successful because it's fantasy fulfillment for teenagers. It has a lot of great comedic moments scattered throughout its aimless story. My favorite scene is this one because Tom's laugh is so genuine it's got to be improvised. Portia, there is no substitute. Fuck you. <laughs> As 80s high school comedies where the parents are out of the equation so a dude and his friends get up to wacky antics go, everything risky business does, Ferris Bueller does better. Are you out of your fucking mind? In the firm, lawyer Tom Cruise joins a firm that seems too good to be true. They give him a house, a Mercedes, and even a gift basket. But all these nice things turn out to be the veil of a dark conspiracy. Because the firm has got some doctored numbers. Actually, no. Uh, they killed some people. They never did find him or the other two. Okay, maybe not. Uh, I think they're involved with the mob. Or something? I don't really know, but they're bad. The guy from Goodfellas shows up at the end, so they've got to be shady. As vaguely bad as the movie wants you to believe the firm is, their screen presence is nowhere near as intimidating. They're just old guys who threaten Tom Cruise. So you watch yourself. I'll do the best I can to protect you. And I know you'll do your best to protect the firm. The movie starts off in a funny place, and then gets tense then they exhausted. It's a shame that they didn't have the budget for a musical orchestra and instead hired one guy to play piano covers of Charlie Brown music. Ah! Pick him up, pick him up! I yeah. Son of a bitch! Thankfully, a few wacky moments cut through the boring plot, such as when Tom Cruise unexpectedly does some flips with the kid. The hell is this? There he goes. And when a chase breaks out with Hank from Breaking Bad. Oblivion is like a commercial for a dystopian future, and I'm buying. If the end of humanity consists of being a Tom Cruise clone who flies around Iceland in a cool looking ship and then comes home to a house and wife in the sky, then bring on the apocalypse. I was initially surprised at how good the CG was in this movie, until I found out how often I wasn't looking at CG. They built the sky house and the sky around it, the bubble ship, the motorcycle and the drones. Oblivion was shot in Iceland's 24 hours of daylight, because director Joseph Kaczynski wanted to subvert the look of science fiction movies. I like the idea of doing a daytime science fiction movie, because I felt like, never since Alien, science fiction kind of went into the darkness. Despite subverting Ridley Scott's nighttime look, Oblivion shares similarities with another Ridley Scott movie. Oblivion is the sci-fi version of Legend. It sounds beautiful, looks beautiful, and means nothing. <laughs> You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. That's the signpost up ahead. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Kaczynski was inspired by the Twilight Zone TV show, where the budget was small and the ideas were big. Oblivion flips the script. Big budget small ideas. It struggles to find something of substance to say. Throughout the movie, Tom Cruise's character collects trinkets from a past earth. These relics include a Yankees cap, books, and music. This is such a bland generalization of humanity. Instead of putting the focus on human values, behavior, and ingenuity, the entirety of our existence is reduced to knickknacks. There's a bit more to being human than liking baseball. The Last Samurai tells the story of an American soldier captured by samurai. 
Gradually, he comes to respect and embrace the way of the samurai. And that's it. The movie is so hollow that a few words can describe the entirety of its depth and nuance. It's a Hollywood movie, through and through. You've seen this story before in Avatar. A man who's lost his will to live finds meaning through exposure to another culture. His identity transforms, and in the climax, he fights against his former allies. Every ethical dilemma is black and white. It paints a romanticized portrait of the samurai, and rests on the foundation of tired story beats. It's a perfectly okay movie that I found myself semi-invested in mostly because of my favorite German music man. Move over, Beethoven, because Hans Zimmer is back in town and he's here to make you feel like a fucking samurai. <sighs> Tom Cruise takes on his most daring performance yet as a weeb. Once again, his commitment to the role is inspiring, spending months watching One Piece, a true hero. He also did sword fighting. I spent eight months training so that I could find that kind of elegance within my own body. I could hopefully achieve some level of grace. The Last Samurai isn't interested in deconstructing the Bushido philosophy and opts for a few words of fortune cookie wisdom instead. To know life in every breath, every cup of tea, every life we take, the way of the warrior. It's hard to watch a Hollywood samurai movie and not compare it to Japanese samurai movies, which rank among the greatest movies ever. They might seem dated, but I promise you, they are as emotionally rich as they are entertaining. If you want to see an interesting deconstruction of Bushido and the practice of seppuku in particular, then watch Harakiri. With Jack Reacher, I expected generic action. That's not what I got. The movie stays afloat because it refuses to be bogged down by the trite habits of Hollywood action. Bland music is one of the most efficient ways to kill an action scene. Intended to create a sense of urgency and excitement, instead it suffocates every frame into monotony. One of the many surprises of Jack Reacher is the choice to not have music at all. It isn't boring without music because the sound design is constantly shifting as the camera switches perspectives. The editing throughout this film is also surprisingly patient. Most Hollywood action movies edit at a breakneck pace, cutting every three seconds even when there isn't any action. Jack Reacher takes its time, lingering on each composition, building up the tension and giving us time to think about the unraveling mystery, which is also gripping. A worthy adaptation of Lee Child's novel. The one thing the action is missing is stakes. Jack Reacher never makes a mistake or is in danger. None of the characters are given any dimension, so it's easy to appreciate the technical aspects but hard to be invested in the story. Almost all of the casting is really great, I especially love the smaller roles, from Robert Duvall giving us a Days of Thunder reunion to Werner Herzog, who is criminally underused and underwritten. The one casting choice that does not work is also the reason why I watched this movie. Tom Cruise still does not work, not only because he doesn't match the physical description of the character, but because he can't be compelling in this version of an action hero. Luckily for Reacher fans, the new TV show features Alan Richson, who is an absolute house of a human being and sells the quiet, clever army man much more captivatingly. <laughs> American Made is more indebted to Scorsese than the Tom Cruise movie directed by Scorsese. It tells the true story of conman aviator Barry Seal in the manner of Goodfellas and Scarface. The visual style is wildly inconsistent. It swaps between locked off shots and succession style handheld. It ranges in saturation from too high to too low, but never just right. Sometimes the historical explanations have a goofy animated cartoon map, sometimes a plain one full of PNGs. The zooms and freeze frames are awkward and clearly the result of decisions made in post. Okay. Okay, you can, you can stop now if you want, because, believe me, shit gets crazy from here. Despite these clumsy stylistic flourishes, American Maid is more fun than the average Scorsese ripoff. It gets by on two things. One, Tom Cruise's performance, where he exhibits his signature charisma, the dangerous smiling maniac. And two, Barry Seal's antics, which are dumb entertainment in the movie and certifiably insane in the context of real life.
All of the best action stars are also really great at comedic timing. Just look at Arnold or Jackie Chan. Tom Cruise is no exception, and this is one of his funniest roles. While it is an honor, General, I'm afraid I'm going to have to decline. Can't stand the sight of blood. Not so much as a paper cut. <laughs> This time, he's a phony officer who has never seen combat, gets drafted, then dies. And then he wakes up and dies again and again and again. And the movie is an inventive comedy that uses Tom's comedic skill and the mechanics of the time loop to tell some brilliant jokes. Then about halfway through, the movie becomes less interested in exploring an impossible situation and more interested in defeating the big bad alien insipidly called the Omega. This. It's the brain. It controls them all. And this is the Omega. And that's when everything falls apart. The fate of the world is at stake, and so nothing is. With epic stakes. Literally, the fate of the world is at stake. The movie ends with a lot of noise and darkness to hide the CG and make it as confusing as possible. In the words of McQuarrie, the three tenets of good action scenes are clarity, geography, and story. Those are, your, those are your big three banners you put at the top. Edge of Tomorrow ends with confusion on all three fronts. With exhausting plot-saving devices and great comedic performances, it's half creative comedy, half standard save the world blockbuster. It's taking me there. What do you it's, it's the Louvre. That's very considerate of the aliens to set up base next to a recognizable landmark. They could have just gone in a field somewhere, but at least they've got their manners. Cocktail understands that a good life is made up of two essential pillars. It's all about money. You know, money and sex. Tom Cruise is now a sexy bartender. He prepared for the role by interviewing bartenders. I interviewed about 35 bartenders and trying to find, uh, you know, a common denominator. And you're not just a bartender, you're an extractor. You want to get the money out of their pocket into your pocket. And by being trained by Olympic bartender J.B. Brandy. I love this movie more than half of Tom Cruise's filmography because it is an absurd mess that keeps your attention from its sheer lunacy alone. It's as if every 10 minutes, the movie is bored with itself and goes in a different direction entirely. Tom Cruise sleeps with three women almost four, until he realizes his body count is getting too absurd for one movie. This is a movie where Tom Cruise looks at a man picking up dog poop and smiles, yeah. recites poetry at a nightclub that is a metaphor for a stardom. America, you're just devoted to every flavor I've got. <laughs> but if you want to get loaded, why don't you just order? and romantically rides a horse on a beach. I could just play shots from this movie and it'd be mesmerizing. You're ugly. The orgasm. I believe in positive thinking. I'm pregnant. Ugh. Help me! You should go to college. See how well you hack it in the real world with an F in this course. F! Oh yeah man, very south of Soho, the Caribbean Jamaica man. This movie will have you yelling, laughing, and clapping at the TV. It is nonsense at its most entertaining. Cocktail is the closest to being terrible, but furthest from being boring. It is a God-given miracle. All hail Cocktail. Alright, alright. Mission Impossible franchise has got a few false starts. All right, we're gonna do a remake of the Mission Impossible TV show and turn it into a Hitchcockian mystery with that stylish Brian De Palma flair. Never mind. Actually, we're gonna make Ethan Hunt cool by giving him guns. Pew, pew, pew. There's gonna be shootouts, and he's gonna have sex. Yeah, sex. The bad guy is Australian, and there's a virus or something. It doesn't need to be a virus. <laughs> okay. So, people didn't like that? I don't know, I don't know. I don't know what to do with the character, okay? So how about we make him a husband? He's a husband now. He has a domestic life, because I don't, I don't know what else to do with the character. 
films. J.J. Abrams made his feature film debut with Mission Impossible 3, a job he got because Tom Cruise watched his Jennifer Garner-led spy TV show Alias, which was inspired by the original Mission Impossible TV show. I love Mission Impossible 3 for remembering what makes Mission Impossible fun. The set piece where the IMF team kidnaps the villain, played by an electric Philip Seymour Hoffman, is a fantastic return back to the roots of the first film. This movie also adds a new spice to the Mission Impossible pantry. A dash of cinnamon is dropped on the franchise in the form of a beautiful British man. Simon Pegg is the perfect person to be in Tom Cruise's ear as he runs around exotic locations. Speaking of which, this shot is cool. Shot on the spider cam, a cable suspended camera system that was also used for this shot on Minority Report, and the web sling in the Spider-Man movies. All attempts to emotionally charge the story fizzle out, from giving Ethan Hunt a domestic life to him training an agent. It's as if these new characters materialized out of nowhere for the sole purpose of stoking Ethan Hunt's emotional stakes. Mission Impossible is starting to grasp its identity, but is still hiding under the wrong mask. When Tom Cruise was cast as Lestat in the film adaptation of the novel Interview with the Vampire, the author, Anne Rice, spoke publicly against the choice, calling it bizarre. The Tom Cruise casting is so bizarre, it's almost impossible to imagine how it's going to work. Her doubts were more than founded, since up to that point Tom Cruise had never played anything remotely close to a gay evil vampire. Lestat is such a radical departure from his previous roles. After seeing the film, she wrote him a letter of apology. Tom Cruise did a marvelous job of playing Lestat. He got the incredible strength of Lestat. He got the sense of humor of Lestat. He got the boldness of Lestat. Tom Cruise ended up being the perfect deranged scene partner for a depressed Brad Pitt. But do it! For do not doubt! You are a killer, Louis! <laughs> to prepare for the role, Tom Cruise watched footage of lions attacking zebras. They wouldn't want to kill the thing immediately. They would play with it. They would let it run. They would let the thing escape. They'd jump in it again. They'd wound it a little bit watch it run off again and jump at it. And that to me kind of is the start. Tom Cruise's other monster movie, The Mummy, comically misunderstands human nature. Vowing revenge, she made a choice to embrace evil. It treats evil like it's a supernatural force rather than being a human capacity. Monsters intrigue us because we see ourselves in them. They are personifications of dark human traits such as malevolence, lust, and pride. Interview with the Vampire investigates what the experience of being a vampire would be like, from immortality to sleeping in a coffin to the ethical dilemma of killing to survive. Through the vampire fiction, it tackles very human feelings of guilt, fear, loss, disappointment, resentment, and so on. Top Gun is the 1980s Hollywood ideal, silhouettes of jets taking off over a saturated sunset, saturated bustling control rooms, saturated sweaty beach volleyball, adrenaline, sex, propaganda, and escapism. These kids must hate me because they all signed on thinking they're going to be fighter pilots pulling broads all over the world and they all ended up you know, 11 stories down and some shitty old aircraft carrier stuck in the Indian Ocean. <laughs> It's all saturated, bold, and unrefined, and if you don't let that saturation glaze your brain over, then you're crashing and burning before you leave the runway. There is no depth and no tension, except for that kind of tension. Don't get me wrong, Top Gun is saturated, but it's not over-saturated. Behind the dumb charm is a carefully constructed genius. They had to cast actors with good looks, charisma, and chemistry with one another, which is harder than it seems. You can't just throw a bunch of attractive faces in a movie and expect them to all bounce off each other. Top Gun best exemplifies the turn-your-brain-off aspect of Tom Cruise. His character is that he doesn't play by the rules and is dangerous, which could not be more perfect. It's the first movie where Tom Cruise really plays the character that we've come to know as Tom Cruise, the genesis of his typecasting. He's one of the few actors who can make an arrogant asshole charming. This is also the first movie where Tom Cruise was involved in the pre-production. I just got involved in terms of developing the script, just to see where it went. Well, I, I put in my contract as a prerequisite. I wanted three, you know, I wanted to fly in the F-14. So I had three hops in the F-14. I had a flight with the Blue Angels. It's, it's so exciting, I mean, the power that you feel. I mean, just sitting on 
on this supersonic, you know, machine. It's, it's amazing. Maverick famously shot in real jets. For the original, most of the exterior shots are real, but the cockpit shots aren't. They put a cockpit of a crashed F-14 on a stage with a projection of the sky behind it. A light mounted on a ring would spin around the cockpit to simulate the sun. For these shots, since they couldn't just blow up $38 million jets, they blew up miniature models instead. Color of Money is both Tom Cruise and Martin Scorsese's first sequel to a movie that neither were involved in. The link from the first to the second being Paul Newman reprising his role as Fast Eddie from The Hustler, a stylish yet slow film about a hotshot pool shark who gets tangled too deep in love and corruption. The Hustler came out the year before Tom Cruise was born. As a leading man, Newman is the precursor to Cruise. He plays the arrogant wise-ass just as well, if not better, in The Hustler. Well, you shoot big-time pool fats. I mean, that's what everybody says, you shoot big-time pool. Let's make it $200 a game. At the time, Scorsese was finding it harder and harder to finance his films. The King of Comedy, one of his best, was a box office flop. The financing for The Last Temptation of Christ was pulled six weeks before production. And the movie he had just directed after hours did okay financially, but he was falling out of favor with the Hollywood executives. He needed a hit. Luckily for Marty, Paul Newman loved Raging Bull, so he wrote a letter to Scorsese asking him if he'd adapt The Color of Money, the sequel to the novel The Hustler, into a movie. Scorsese agreed, partly because he was interested in the character of Eddie Felsen and partly because he wanted funding for his future movies. Even if the film is riddled with tropes, it never stops being satisfying to see the team up of these two guys in a Scorsese movie. It's in the spot above Top Gun because as well as having a charming show off Tom Cruise, it uses that character, along with Newman's, to explore themes of obsolescence, talent, and male ego. Then the pool scenes are electrifying. There's a real sense of creative experimentation in the way they're shot and edited, which makes them so much fun to watch. <laughs> A legacy sequel for this legacy sequel would be perfect if there was an upcoming leading man who could hold his own against these big boys. I can't think of one though, so if you got anyone, comment away. It's been said that Ghost Protocol is when Mission Impossible really figured out what it was. Tom would say that the series really figured out what it was in Ghost Protocol. The truth is they got it right the first time. This movie sets up almost all of the foundations, the mystery. Where you're kind of unwrapping the onion. Wrapping, another wrapping. Oh, and you find out, then you go over there and you find, oh, but he really was, you know, all this sort of stuff. The suspenseful set pieces. I saw Tom Cruise in three incredible set pieces. The exotic locations. Mission Impossible was originally set in the United States, and I said, Tom, this is Mission Impossible. We can go all over the world, you know, there are these big, huge movie stars and all these countries who are dying to be in this. The narrative slights of hand, where all of a sudden, with one reveal, everything you thought to be real is a fallacy and the room turns in on itself. By this point, Tom Cruise has mastered the character he plays in most of his movies. His intensity and confidence are at their most convincing and electric. You've seen this trick? Where'd it go? Brian De Palma is so damn good at presenting information in his incredibly stylized, cinematic way. His sense of pacing and rhythm for suspense is perfect. A lot of that suspense was created by trapping the characters in confined spaces, air conditioning ducts, elevator shafts, and train compartments, as well as through the sound design, playing with silence. There is one missing Mission Impossible foundation, and that is in-camera set pieces. Out of the three main set pieces in Mission Impossible, only one falls short. The train chase scene is the reigning example here. Even if the action is beautiful, the weight, proximity, and danger of filming action in-camera cannot be replicated in a computer, especially one in 1996. That being said, I do love how ludicrous the concept of a helicopter chasing a train in a tunnel is.
When Steven Spielberg was 17, he directed his first feature film with sound, Firelight. Forty-one years later, he directs his second alien invasion horror movie, War of the Worlds. War of the Worlds is an enthralling horror adventure. It's a study of human behavior, our curiosity of threats, horde mentality, and instinct to survive and protect our kin, and it's sandwiched between the stupidest intro and outro I've seen in a movie. The movie starts with a drop of CG water turning into planet Earth, turning into a red traffic light, cutting to stock footage as Morgan Freeman reads out passages from the novel by H.G. Wells that the film is based on. With infinite complacency, men went to and fro about the globe. Then, after two hours of escaping into the first-person account of a father discovering aliens and then desperately trying to keep his kids alive, Morgan Freeman shows up again, saying, <laughs> Remember me? After all of man's weapons and devices had failed. No! I forgot about you! Stupid Morgan Freeman is completely out of place in the context of the movie. This is the second time this has happened. What I find fascinating about War of the Worlds is the seamless blend between practical sets and computer-generated effects. There's a moment where Tom Cruise's character steps outside a basement to find a commercial plane has crashed on the neighborhood. This is a huge set that took several months to make with pieces of a real 747. This is the value of big budget movies, to sell the impossible. The plane was cut up, dressed, and set dressing put a lot of the debris around and the engines were smoking and on fire which was quite an undertaking and it took several months for the production group to facilitate that. Practical effects are impressive, but the applications of CG shouldn't be underestimated. The mayhem and destruction in War of the Worlds is proof. Very tense. This is going to be scary. This is a scary movie. This is, this is a scary, intense film. Show you the money. Oh, no, no, you can do better than that, Jerry. I want you to say it with you with me then, brother. Hey, I got Bob Sugar on the other line. I better hear you say it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Show, Show me the money. There's something unnerving about the poster for Jerry Maguire. I think it's how general it is. With Legend, the title is ambiguous, but at least we can deduce that it's a fantasy movie. But Jerry Maguire gives us nothing. Nothing but Tom Cruise smiling, facing away from us. Usually he's staring right at us, so why is he all of a sudden being shy? I thought I knew you, Tom. I thought we were friends, but now you're playing some sort of sick game? And the title, what, what does it mean? It's just a name? Who is? Jerry Maguire. I don't know what type of movie this is. Is it, is it a biopic? Should I know this man? Is it a mystery? Because it sure feels like one right now. Um, and the movie is good. It's one of those rare comedies that manages to find humor in human sincerity. You know, I think uh, comedy is pain, as I said before. <laughs> and that you, to, to really have it be funny, you have to go for that emotional reality. Tom Cruise has perfected the art of anger. Fine, fine! Fine! Jerry, talk to me. Breathe! But his greatest strength is the people around him. His scene partners are exceptional. The reigning performance being the little man in big glasses, Jonathan Lipnicki. Too often, kids in movies aren't kids. They are adults that look like kids. Lipnicki makes the entire cast of Harry Potter look like amateurs. Do you know bees and dogs can smell beer? That being said, unlike the movie it's based on, The Apartment, Jerry Maguire fumbles with the drama. While the dramatic beats usually strike out, the comedy is usually a home run or a touchdown. Hole in one! Slam dunk! I love getting up in the morning. I clap my hands and say, this is going to be a great day. Courtroom dramas provide a special kind of cinematic satisfaction. Ethical dilemmas are deconstructed. Prosecution and defense spar for the moral high ground. Language is the weapon, and evidence is the ammunition. Finally, the smoke and mirrors clear and shatter, leaving us with the irrevocable climactic truth. A Few Good Men is one of the genre's best. Both the original Broadway play and screenplay were written by this guy. Most scenes in the film 
uh, are, are near direct transfers from what they were uh, uh, in the play. Aaron Sorkin made his screenwriting debut here, introducing the world to his signature quick draw snappy dialogue. Commander, from what I understand, if this thing goes to court, they won't need a lawyer, they'll need a priest. No, they'll need a lawyer. It's a style of dialogue that was perfected in the 40s with movies like His Girl Friday. Would you mind if I sat down? There's been a lamp burning in the window for you, honey, here. Oh, I jumped out that window a long time ago, Walter. These movies take place in an alternate reality where everybody is clever all of the time, zigging one-liners off each other faster than I can think. With the 10-foot tall screen presence of Jack Nicholson, brilliant plotting by Aaron Sorkin, and story-serving direction of Rob Reiner, the verdict is clear. Guilty of being good. I'm sorry. Well, I think the first thing that made Stanley Kubrick so special was he was a chameleon. He never made the same picture twice. Every single picture is a different genre, a different period, a different story, a different risk. The only thing that bonded all of his films was the incredible virtuoso that he was with craft. Isn't Kubrick one of the most fun director names to say? Kubrick, 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 Kubrick. Kubrick has a knack for getting in your headspace. Whether his movies deal with big existential spectacle or intimate perverse thoughts, Eyes Wide Shut has Kubrick tackling fidelity, marriage, jealousy, and sex. Very clearly about the mutual manipulation of jealousy, which is torture. It's what we can do to one another in the most intimately painful way. Told from the perspective of Tom Cruise as Dr. Bill Harford, as he wanders city streets ruminating over his wife's confession of fantasy trying to cheat on her yet never following through, every moment is imbued with paranoia. As the night goes on, his interactions grow more absurd. And every single story somehow was so mysterious in the way the story was told, so kept you guessing, how's this gonna turn out? What's gonna happen next? I can't even imagine. I can't pretend to understand most of Eyes Wide Shut. After watching it, I thought, this isn't deep at all. Then after reading about it, I realized this is so deep. The motif of masks, for example, went right over my head. In his comprehensive article, Sven Mikulik breaks it down. The literal masks worn at the orgy are symbolic of the metaphorical ones that the protagonists of the film and probably every other person in the real world wear on a daily basis to accommodate the roles we play in life, of a husband, a doctor, a stranger, or a guest at a party. It might be unfair to compare it with Kubrick, but at the end of Vanilla Sky, everything is explained. There aren't any questions left to ask because they've all been explained away. As a result, I haven't thought about the film since. There's value in ambiguity. Like any other Kubrick film, pieces of Eyes Wide Shut nag at my thoughts from time to time. Unanswered questions, transfixing performances. Kubrick's movies are so meticulously researched and intentionally composed that they beg investigation. Kubrick has a knack for getting in your headspace and then staying there long after the movie is over. They are like a puzzle. The Rubik's Cube Frick. Of all the major action franchises, today Mission Impossible is the best. The reason why is simple. It has the best action. Ghost Protocol reinvented Mission Impossible into the best by realizing that the way forward was by looking back. You know, when I look back and I, you know, I'm a lover of film, so I watch a lot of movies. And in growing up, you know, looking at, you know, Buster Keaton. Buster Keaton. Buster, Buster Keaton. Keaton. Buster Keaton is the 1920s action star, and his silent films are secretly some of the best action films ever made. This is because, like Ghost Protocol, they understand that compelling action rests on three things. Clarity, geography, and story. Those are your, those are your big three banners you put at the top. One. Clarity. Every good action scene is driven by a clear goal, clear action, and clear stakes. Ethan Hunt has to climb the burge to get to a room that can only be accessed from the outside. As he climbs, instead of having to vaguely gauge how tired he looks, we can easily follow the action through the color on his gloves. Blue is glue. And when it's red, dead. As for the stakes, well, how about a 2,000 foot drop? Two. 
geography. This is similar to clarity. It's having a clear sense of where everything is. It allows us to follow the action more closely and actually get invested in it. Here's a great example from Buster Keaton's The General. The wide unbroken shot allows us to clearly see the chase, how the villains connect to the trolley and Keaton disconnects. Three, story. Action is just another form of storytelling. It's made of obstacles and resolutions. For Mission and Keaton, it's usually a process of constantly improvising as everything goes wrong. Gadgets break. He doesn't make the jump. Problems arise with enough clarity and established geography so as to keep us following the action and guessing what comes next. The resolution then acts as the punchline, often something unexpected that smoothly leads to the next problem. We can't open this door, can we? The door? No. Ethan, you gotta get down here now. E Ethan! telling a story the same way I'm telling the, my writing my screenplay the same way I'm telling a joke I mean screenwriting is just a very sophisticated form of setup and payoff and telling a joke it's the same kind of storytelling there's another big parallel between Buster Keaton's silent films and the Mission Impossible film starting with Ghost Protocol. Because what they're shooting is real, the line between the actor and the character is blurred. That's not just Ethan Hunt hanging off the tallest building in the world. That is Tom Cruise. And this is Buster Keaton inches from being pancaked. The stunts are real, making them so much more exciting and engaging. And what Tom and I have learned to do um, over the course of three of these movies together now is we're constantly striving to make a silent film. We're, we're pushing harder and harder with each film to find ways to make movies where the dialogue doesn't matter. Ghost Protocol turned the Mission Impossible franchise into modern silent comedies. It is Brad Bird's first live action movie after having directed the animated trifecta of The Iron Giant, The Incredibles, and Ratatouille. It is a funny movie, leaning into how goofy and cool spy movies can be. Ghost Protocol is the lesser of the best because I find the third act to be a letdown, especially after the Birch climb and the Sandstorm chase. Michael Mann directed Collateral after his two-hour and 45-minute Muhammad Ali biopic because he wanted to make something smaller and more personal. And he did. Collateral is a contained thriller that explores the dramatic possibilities of a simple premise while imparting a solid message. Vincent, the calculating, relentless hitman who justifies his occupation with existential BS, is one of Tom Cruise's most fitting roles. To fully embody the character, Tom Cruise did extensive target practice with live ammo, mapped out the entire history of the character, and stalked crew members. We got a deal. Here's 300 down. What's your name? Max. Max. I'm Vincent. Vincent is a compelling villain because he represents everything that the protagonist lacks. He's efficient and decisive. Max, Jamie Foxx's character, starts the movie as anything but that. You know, it's temporary while I'm getting some things shaped up. This is just temporary. How long have you been driving? 12 years. Really? The only things that detached me from the film were a few odd music choices. Especially in the coyote scene, which should have been mesmerizing, but instead it feels jarring and dated. Then in the final chase scene, much of the tension is diffused with the overbearing, tense music. Collateral should have taken a page from Jack Reacher and played that scene in silence to sell the reality of the danger more convincingly. Seen in Minority Report where a horde of spider-like robots search an apartment complex for Tom Cruise's character. The sequence is the perfect encapsulation of the movie's dazzling visual storytelling, tensely staged plot points, and inventive design. It is the product of exceptional artistic collaboration, from the design of the spiders. My um, description was something like a pager designed by Porsche that would clip onto the cop's belt so that when they initially take it off you really have no idea what it is and it looks more like 
maybe a grenade or, or some piece of mechanics. To the cinematography. The camera is going to be looking everywhere. So subsequently, there's no place to hide the light, which means every single moment section of the movement had to be pre precisely rehearsed and, and had to be perfect, you know? To the music. French horns that are stopped, marimbas that are playing, violas all together in this kind of middle register with a kind of a irritating, nasty little rub to it and beat to it. It kind of makes you feel like if this creature would be on your skin, you want to get him off. The short story Minority Report is based on is short. With 45 pages, it doesn't provide much to go off of. The film borrows the premise of pre-crime, the name of a few characters, and four or five lines of dialogue. The commission of the crime itself is absolute metaphysics. But is otherwise completely the invention of Spielberg and his team. They built the entire design of this futuristic world with what turned out to be some prophetic technology. Keep in mind, this movie was released in 2002, before the widespread use of touchpads and the ubiquity of targeted ads. Hello, Mr. Yakamoto. Welcome back to the Gap. How those assorted tank tops work out for you. Production designer Alex McDowell came up with the idea of having a series of concentric circles and wave patterns on the walls of the precog chamber set so that it reflect the narrative motif of water. The idea is that narrative is a series of ripples with a single inception point. The movie portrays philosophical dilemmas, the intrusiveness of advertising, the illusion of free will and the loss of civil liberty in an incredibly entertaining twisty turny mystery from the minds of writers Scott Frank and John Cohen. Spielberg and Cruz are like Cameron and Schwarzenegger. They are the perfect pairing of fine cheese and wine, but Minority Report is a full course meal. It is Spielberg, Cruz, McDowell, Frank, Cohen, Kaminsky, Kahn, Scott and more, each contributing their own ingredient. So it was a hybrid movie for me about my love of film noir and at the same time and my love of a good old fashioned murder mystery yarn and then all the political implications that were involved in free will and knowing what your future is. Dead Reckoning knows what you want from a Mission Impossible movie. I love these characters and had so much fun seeing them all confront the impossible again. Haley Atwell is an outstanding addition. People in the theater collectively giggling when Tom Cruise does something clever and collectively leaning forward during the action is what the big screen is all about. The action scenes aren't squeezed together back to back to back quite as much as Fallout, but they are no less visceral. It is such a smart movie. For a franchise about defying narrative expectations, it's clever to explore themes of free will and fate. The question is always, what is going to happen? So why not make that the central question of the movie? In life, we never know what is going to happen. Just like Ethan Hunt and the IMF team, we can only improvise. The problem with CGI, and it's extremely useful in a lot of different ways, you get exactly what you want. And what we've learned from practical action, we very often don't get what we want. We get what fate and circumstance and unpredictable physics give us. That gives you something real and chaotic and completely grounded that you couldn't get any other way. We lean into the chaos. It is an homage to Buster Keaton as well as the first Mission Impossible and a forward seat leaning delight. I didn't have a single thought for the last 45 minutes. They really did it and I couldn't be more excited to see what they do next. It truly is the honor of a lifetime. Yeah. where the story develops organically as a consequence of the character's choices, where there's no apparent structure to it and you can't tell that this is the break in act two when the character is at his darkest moment, where just like in life, things happen and we react to them. I felt comfortable watching Rain Man, like I was tucked in and listening to a bedtime story, one I wouldn't mind listening to for another hour. The movie manages to be sentimental without being sappy, fun without making fun, finding its emotions in reality. Rain Man doesn't have any stupid catharsis where it turns out Raymond was faking being autistic all along. He finishes the movie in exactly the same place where he started. Instead, it's Charlie who finds himself caring and loving another person. 
Many directors played Hot Potato with Rain Man, including Spielberg, who spent five months on the project. I remember every time a director would leave the project, I called Dustin and say, come on, man, what's going on here? Is this going to happen? Is this going to happen? And, and he said, you know, just hang in there. We're going to make this movie. And uh, it was one of those great experiences. Eventually, Rain Man got picked up by Barry Levinson, who along with screenwriter Ron Bass rewrote a script that initially included a motorcycle gang that was going to shake down Charlie for money, stripping down the screenplay so that it'd just be about these two brothers. And that's why I love Rain Man. There are no kids in a burning building, it's just about these brothers, never deviating from their relationship, its humor, frustration, and love. It's cool how in Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, Cruz and McQuarrie took sequences from their previous films and expanded them into something bigger and better. From the car chase in Jack Reacher to this. From the underwater sequence in Edge of Tomorrow to this. Rogue Nation is filled to the brim with big bald stunts and set pieces. They manage to add Airplane to the list of high-speed vehicles Tom Cruise hangs off of. But what truly separates Rogue Nation from the first four Mission movies is that they finally nailed the full cast of characters. Ethan Hunt and Luther Stickle are back. Benji is as funny and likable as ever, making us actually care when he is held hostage because that isn't his sole purpose as a character. Rebecca Ferguson's Ilsa makes her appearance as the first good female character in the franchise, who doesn't only exist to be Ethan's love interest or just another bland member of the team. Sean Harris's performance is unnerving as hell, adding a second ominous villain to the franchise. Rogue Nation feels like an old romantic Hollywood spy movie with silent era stunts. The visual comedy is relentlessly well executed. Also, the dialogue. If you're going to bring me all this way, you could at least give me something a bit more, you know, dramatic. Benji, we're trying to keep a low profile. You want drama? Go to the opera. It's got all the action, all the comedy, all the classic spy stuff, and all the impeccably timed theme music needle drops. And I can tell you, it's impossible. It's funny to think about now, but my expectations going into this movie weren't high. A Top Gun sequel 36 years later sounded like another Force Awakens or Jurassic World. A generic sequel released to keep the franchise relevant and sell lunchboxes, or in this case, Navy recruitment. Top Gun Maverick feels like good old action blockbuster escapism. It's the perfect antidote to the onslaught of uninspired movies that feel like they were written in a week, are filled with rushed CG, and are quickly released to feed the studio's content schedule. Don't get me wrong, this is still totally a movie made to cash in on an established IP. It's great not because it has the most original concept or story, but because the execution of every aspect of this film is 10 out of 10, would eat here again. Real jets. Real popcorn. Creating the movie was a tedious and expensive process. They'd have two hour briefings at 5 a.m. in the morning before sending the actors out in the jets with Navy pilots. When they came back, they reviewed the footage, they'd see what worked and what didn't, and repeat it all the next day. Editor Eddie Hamilton, who also edited Rogue Nation, Fallout, and Dead Reckoning Parts 1 and 2, had to sift through an unethical amount of footage. More than 
800 hours of it. How he watched 80 hours of Miles Teller grimacing in a cockpit and kept his sanity is inexplicable. And their hard work paid off big time. Maverick stayed in the theaters for almost a year. It is by far the highest grossing Tom Cruise movie, making almost double the gross of his second highest grossing film. You either like Top Gun Maverick or you haven't seen it yet. If I have to nitpick though, the only thing I don't like about this movie is the Lady Gaga song at the end. It pulls me out every time. It felt more like a market decision than a story decision. How does Christopher McQuarrie write the Mission Impossible set pieces? He doesn't just sit down and write, instead, he travels. So what I do now is I go to a city with no preconceived notion as to what the action scene is going to be, and I let the city tell me. That way the geography of a location can be tangible and interactive. When Ethan Hunt is escaping the police, he can jump into this hole and escape through a canal system on a boat. All because McQuarrie found this location while scouting. Watching a Mission Impossible movie, the experience of watching it, is very much like the experience of making it. A lot of times we put together these sequences not knowing how we're going to solve these problems. I'm going to get the detonator. Well, how? I'll figure it out. And it's always just about doing it in a way that just feels real enough because the, they're so outrageous. Mission Impossible Fallout is ambitious as hell. It is full of the most impressive action scenes I've seen in any movie and refuses to have a single dull moment. The car chase through Paris was inspired by the 1976 short film C'était un grand début. which was shot by mounting a camera to the front of a Mercedes, tearing its way through Paris at an average speed of 80 kilometers per hour. For Fallout, these motorcycle stunts were shot without a helmet or pads. For the Halo Jump, it's easy to forget that it's not just Tom Cruise skydiving, but also a camera operator who's doing exactly what Tom Cruise is doing, but backwards. Craig O'Brien had to hit his marks and pull focus while falling in midair. Follow is also an unexpectedly stylish movie. Every character's wardrobe is immaculate, the music is ingenious. I have nothing but praise, love, and excitement to throw at this movie. But it looked cool, so I was like, all right, let's, you know, I can do this. The cock. And tame the cock. Magnolia is a personal confession told at an epic scale. It is one of the most honest depictions of people, of our emotions, desires, and fears that I've seen. Here's what it's about: is it's about uh, parent-children relationships, you know, and, and 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 how that informs who you are, who we are. Um, it's about how you grow up and how that affects who you are. Yeah, mommy wouldn't let me play soccer, and daddy, well, he hit me. So that's that's who I am. That's that's why I do what I do. <laughs> Bullshit. It has nine main characters that it treats with compassion, letting them express themselves and try to reason with one another. They feel authentic partly because they were written specifically for the actors who play them. He called me after he'd seen Boogie Nights, and that's the phone call from the president of the United States of <laughs> movie land, you know? And because uh, I wouldn't... It doesn't get any bigger than that. No, literally, it doesn't. Not only do I think this is Tom Cruise's best movie, but I also think this is his best character and best performance. It's remarkable how international superstar Tom Cruise, the guy who seems to pop out of the screen, melts into an honest-to-God character. It was great, because I wouldn't have called him. I was a huge fan of his work, but it's that ungettable thing you know you just don't think I'll never get Tom Cruise in my movie his celebrity charisma and good looks are assets used to create pickup artist Frank TJ Mackey whose misogynistic seminars are both satire on masculine insecurity and an expression of his own trauma when things go wrong do you think they're gonna be there for us oh you think again oh fucking Denise Denise the piece you were gonna give me that cherry pie sweet mama baby <laughs> 
He is a deeply personal character created by the lives of both Tom and Paul, a son who needs to forgive his dad. And so Tom and I just sort of chatted, and I, and I was just starting to think of this character that he plays in the movie. And there's just something just brought up the naughty side in me. I don't know what it was. I just sort of looked, and I said, oh, I know exactly what to do here, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so I wrote, wrote uh, Frank T.J. Mackey the part for, yeah. for Tom. The movie is full of living, breathing characters. Characters who parallel one another. Some are different people with the same problems. Others are the same person at different stages of life. It is about how similar we really are. Magnolia realizes that we all want love and validation for what we do right and forgiveness for what we've done wrong. If you look at this movie at this moment, mm -hmm. the one that is in the theaters today, yeah, it's the movie you wanted to make. Exactly. Is it the movie you set out to make? Exactly, yeah. Tom Cruise represents a time when star power still had influence over a movie's box office success, when studios took big risks on original stories, as long as big names were on the poster. Today, superheroes will more reliably bring an audience to a theater. So is the movie star dead? Not completely. Well-known names and faces still sell tickets, but not as reliably. The thing is, though, movie stars are just as artificial and larger than life as superheroes. It's different packaging, same great flavor. Tom Cruise's full name is Thomas Cruise Mapother IV, which begs the question, where are the other four Tom Cruises? Maybe the reason why he does his own stunts is because his stunt doubles are him. Maybe there's one Scientology Tom Cruise, one character actor Tom Cruise, one disposable stuntman Tom Cruise, and one press tour Tom Cruise. Who is the real Tom Cruise? Maybe whenever he hangs off a plane or falls off a helicopter, that's Tom Cruise number three. They must have lost a few of them while he was doing his stunts, so how many are left? Are they gonna stop doing Mission Impossible movies when they run out? We have this image of Tom Cruise, the one on our screens, in talk shows, in the magazine as you're checking out your groceries. Huh, man, Tom Cruise is dating everyone in Hollywood? And they divorced? To us, he is just as much a character in a magazine, a talk show, or in the movies. But to me, he is Jesus Christ incarnate. I'm kidding, of course, but I do have a massive amount of respect for him since he created some of my favorite characters in some of my favorite movies, and because he is keeping the tradition of in-camera action alive at a big scale. I mean, you can't get much bigger than space, right? But despite having watched all his movies, I don't know him, so I can't have an opinion about him. This is a guy who has been twisted around in our collective imaginations for a while. It's easy to forget that his persona is a facade and he is just another person. You know, he allows himself to be surrounded by a lot of mystique and conjecture and gossip mm. and he just sort of lets it fester. Mm -hmm. And I think that makes people think that he's some kind he's of un inhuman kind of thing. But he's just, he's just a bloke, yeah. as we say in the UK.